Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is Big Night Migration, Part 1, Save the Salamanders. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Charlie Reinertson. Charlie, thank you so much for being here today. I cannot wait to hear what you have to say about these salamanders. Let's dive in. Hi, Sonny, and welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for that introduction, and thanks for joining me this afternoon to chat about salamanders as well as other amphibians who are getting ready uh, to make one of their epic uh, movements, which is what we call the big night migration. Uh, we're going to talk about the importance of this ecological event. Uh, I'll introduce myself and then we'll get into some amphibian ecology 101 um, and then dive into what is this big night and how can we help uh, for people who live in communities where this is happening um, and also for people who are just interested in supporting these amphibians as they make their way uh, from their upland forest habitats down into the vernal pools uh, where they are headed very soon. Uh, so a little bit about me, I live in Saranac Lake, New York, uh, in the heart of Adirondack Park, and I've worked in the field of science communications for the last decade. Um, I'm a photographer and videographer and writer, and most recently the, my work that brought me here was working on a climate Solu solutions exhibit at the Wild Center, uh, which is a natural history museum up in this area. And recently, I've started working with uh, my own company, Two Line Studio, that gives me a lot more flexibility to start guiding again. And I've been doing that with Natural Habitat Adventures. And uh, the trips that I guide are on the Yellowstone and Grand Teton Wildlife Safari, uh, the Canyons trip, as well as the Monarch Migration, which is happening right now. Uh, but today, we're going to get to talk about something pretty special. Uh, which is amphibian ecology and the big night migration. Uh, so I thought we'd jump right in. And if you're interested in this topic, um, I'll be talking about it again next week. Uh, and we'll get a little bit into uh, what we'll be covering then. But for tonight, uh, let's take a look at the uh, big night migration and what is happening here. So Amphibians are including frogs, newts, salamanders, and Sicilians. We're not going to talk about Sicilians. They're their own group. They live in a very limited area, um, but we're going to focus on frogs, newts, and salamanders. And the geographic region that we're really focusing on today um, is in our northern forests, and that kind of expands from the Great Lakes area all the way out to the eastern seaboard up into Maine and parts of Canada. Uh, this type of migration happens in other places uh, around North America, um, but it's heavily concentrated in the Northeast. Uh, so just a little bit about amphibians before we get into uh, the big night migration and what's happening there. Um, amphibians, all of them are cold-blooded. Uh, so they're ectotherms uh, versus humans, which are endotherms, meaning that we generate our own heat and we're able to maintain an internal temperature. Uh, these amphibians like frogs and uh, also reptiles uh, are all cold blooded. So they're getting their warmth from the environment. So whatever uh, habitat that they're in, whether they're submerged in water uh, or they're sunning themselves on a rock, they are getting that extra, they're trying to move themselves around that ecosystem so that they can get their internal body temperature at a place that's a good operating level. And that actually drives them to do certain things that we'll talk about a little bit in depth today. Amphibians also have uh, two life stages. They have a juvenile phase and then an adult phase. Here we're taking a look at the eastern newt, uh, and on the left is their juvenile stage, uh, when they're an aquatic uh, larva, and then on the right-hand side, you're seeing their eft stage where they're actually on land. Uh, and this is a particularly interesting amphibian because at some point in their life, they can actually revert back to being a water-dwelling uh, morph. And when we look at amphibians as a whole, they oftentimes have an amphibious phase where they might even have gills 
uh, and then a terrestrial phase where they live on land. Another thing that amphibians share across the group is that many of them breathe uh, through their skin. And that's done through um, having a membrane that is very moist. And, and so this is a supplement to having lungs. Some amphibians don't even have lungs and they exclusively breathe through their skin. Uh, and this actually comes into play in a number of, of areas, uh, one of which is that it's really important when handling amphibians or encountering them that they, uh, they're they really susceptible to taking chemicals through their skin. And so due to that, it's really important to have clean hands and to have not used any products uh, if you are uh, going to catch and, and try and to, uh, take a close look at some amphibians. The other piece of this is that we often think of amphibians as, or maybe a few of us don't think of amphibians at all, uh, but these uh, creatures can actually live for decades. Not all of them, but some of them have been observed to live very, very long lives, which is kind of a surprising fact uh, that you might not have thought about when you think of toads and frogs and salamanders. Here's that eighth grade science uh, you know, uh, slide that you may have seen before, uh, showing that a lot of amphibians go through a life cycle that's called metamorphosis. And in this life cycle, an adult frog will lay eggs and those eggs are fertilized and then they hatch out and they have a tadpole or an aquatic stage of life. And in this example for this frog, uh, it's actually showing that they have gills, they're able to breathe underwater, um, and eventually that uh, they metamorphose into the adult frog that is terrestrial, probably still living very close to water and really uh, heavily involved in that aquatic ecosystem, but now breathing through lungs. And this is a shared characteristic across amphibians. The other thing that they share is that amphibians will actually freeze over winter. So if you've ever wondered where are the frogs and salamanders spending their time when the landscape is frozen, they're not migrating to warmer places. These are very small animals. Uh, that would be very, very challenging for them. They are, in fact, just burying themselves either in leaf litter on the forest floor or in the banks of rivers and ponds and burying down in the mud, and then they literally freeze for the winter. And kind of similar to plants, uh, they're able to actually shunt around sugars and they move water in and out of cells to try and prevent ice formation in certain organs. But otherwise, they really do freeze. Uh, so that movement of sugars is actually helping to depress the freezing point uh, so that they don't form ice in their vital organs. Uh, so this is a pretty amazing uh, feature of amphibians that uh, as that cold weather sets in, they just reduce their metabolism and they literally freeze. And then when spring comes, those animals are able to reanimate as basically as soon as they thaw. Uh, and so this, when this happens, they're biggest objective is to move out of the forest where they've been spending uh, the winter, the upland forest, and move into what's called vernal pools. Now, vernal pools are pockets of water that are only there for a short time. And they're really important to the life cycle of amphibians because they have a lot fewer predators than an established water body that's there for the whole year might have. The only problem with this is that vernal pools, as it would suggest with their name, ephemeral pools is the other name for them, they're only there for a limited time and they dry up at some point in the season. So that puts a lot of time pressure where the amphibians want to gather in these small bodies of water to be able to mate and reproduce. And they do these big spawning events where all of the individuals from a species will gather and they will mate, and then that pool will have just hundreds and thousands of, of young developing in those waters. And so they have to time it perfectly so that they get there when the water is uh, thawed, when it's, it's no longer ice covered, um, and they're there as early as possible uh, so that they can lay those eggs and there's enough time for the eggs to develop 
uh, and become adults before that body of water dries up. Now, this doesn't mean that amphib amphibians won't lay their eggs in ponds or lakes or streams. They will. It's just that vernal pools are one of the places, they're kind of these sanctuaries where if the amphibians can find a vernal pool that's a really good place, that is going to really boost their numbers because they'll have a greater survival rate than they would in a pond where there are fish because fish are one of the big predators. Uh, here we've got a picture of brook trout that I've taken. All of these photos are ones that I've taken. Um, and next week I'll talk more about kind of photographic techniques uh, for big night migration. But uh, right here we're looking at a brook trout and these are big predators uh, along with other fish species of those eggs as well as tadpoles. Another predator uh, in vernal pools even are the larvae of dragonflies. So dragonflies, uh, they develop, they have a, a process of metamorphosis as well and their larval phase is a macroinvertebrate and it lives underwater and it has this incredible mouthpiece uh, that's able to shoot out and stab its prey. So they're actually really good hunters under the water. Uh, there's some interesting videos that you can look up of slow motion showing how they hunt their prey, which are pretty interesting. Uh, we won't show those, but just know that it's interesting that one of the big predators, especially in vernal pools where you don't have uh, fish um, uh, of so one of the big predators is actually damselfly and dragonfly larva. Um, so that brings us to the big night. If you go back a little bit here, this is the spring migration right now. As these ecosystems are starting to thaw out, the ground is starting to thaw, the snow is melting, the pools are. Are, are no longer covered in ice. These amphibians are, are waking up from their frozen slumber and they are making their way to pools uh, to be able to spawn. And this happens when conditions are perfect. And so those conditions are a string of nights that are above 40 degrees Fahrenheit um, and they are also wet and rainy. So those factors so no snowpack, the ground is thawed, and there are multiple nights that are above 40 and rain. That's going to trigger the migration. And all of a sudden, all of these amphibians that have been waiting for the right moment are going to converge on these wetland areas. They're going to make their way from the upland woodlands into the vernal pools. And this migration, depending on the species and depending on the individual, uh, can be as far as a half mile, uh, and in some instances, even further. Uh, and again, they're gathering to lay their eggs and to mate. Um, and for frogs, they're calling. This is a really ruckus time of year. And if you start to have the windows open in later spring, uh, you if you're in an area where this is happening, you can start to hear the different frog species calling. And perhaps next week we'll talk a little bit about the sequencing because different frogs emerge at different times. And the frogs that are uh, in particular the fastest out of the gates are the wood frogs. Uh, so you might hear the cackling of a wood frog out in a vernal pool. And that will tell you that pretty soon the salamanders are going to start to migrate. And so right here we're taking a look at a spotted salamander, which is one of the species of concern in this area in Adirondack Park. Um, and there are also, so when, when these individuals are gathering into one place, uh, they end up inevitably uh, crossing roads. And these are areas where it's incredibly uh, high rates of mortality. A lot of individuals are dying because they're getting run over by cars. And in some places, in, when, when a road crosses that migration route, in between their upland forest habitat and the wetland that they're making their way to, um, you can have just incredible mortality in these areas. And so uh, what's really encouraging is that uh, we've seen a lot of seasonal road closures in salamander habitat. Uh, you know, these are different news clippings from Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, and also the Upper Peninsula of Michigan showing different road closures that are happening uh, to be able to help 
uh, these salamanders across the road. And the reason why these animals need a really wet and rainy uh, condition is that, again, a lot of them are breathing at least in part through their skin. And you need to have a really moist uh, barrier to be able to help with that gas exchange. If they dry up, they're not able to breathe as easily. And, uh, and in general, they just need to be able to have that moisture to get them there. Um, and so that's why you're having these huge migration events very condensed into a short period of time because the other factor is they want to travel at night. So the big, big time uh, for these creatures is above 40, wet, and the right from dusk for the next couple hours is the peak activity level. And instead of just being one big night, it's often a string of big nights in the spring. Um, so one of the big focuses uh, for conservation groups uh, is to actually start to create ways to help the salamanders and the frogs and the newts cross the road. One of the ways that we do this is through creating underpasses for wildlife. So we've heard about, potentially heard about overpasses created for big land migrations of, of various different deer and moose and bear, especially out west in Canada has been leading the way. Uh, but another type of wildlife crossing is this underpass. And these do not have to be as large as uh, the overpasses that we see for some of the bigger migrations. But these do have to have some type of fencing element to help congregate the animals and move them into the funnel uh, to get them across. And it takes a lot of wildlife surveys and identification of roads where you know that there's going to be a high volume of amphibians moving from one area to another across a road. Uh, these pictures were taken in British Columbia. These were not taken by me. Um, and then here we have uh, some pictures of a smaller style of, of road crossing uh, in Darby Creek Metro Park, which I believe is in Ohio. Uh, so there are a number of different environmental, environmental firms specializing in um, how do you make these economically and ensure you'll see that there are actually slats that are allowing the rain uh, to be able to get through to that little underpass. And that's to ensure that the climate inside this little tunnel is the same as the climate above it. Uh, because again, these animals are relying on these very, very particular conditions that allow them to make that trek uh, from their wintering grounds into the vernal pools. Now, another factor that's stacked up against these amphibians are the impacts of climate change. So right now, because we're having drier uh, summers, and we're also having longer summers, shorter winters, warmer winters in the in our northern forests, uh, we're having an impact on these big night migrations. So in the past, there was a fairly uh, predictable, uh, steady increase in temperature in the spring. And the amphibians would rely on that to be able to time the migration properly. Uh, but right now we're starting to see more volatility in our spring warm up. Uh, right now in Adirondack Park for the last few days, this is fairly unheard of. Here we are in early March uh, and we've had multiple days over 50 degrees. We've had a lot of the conditions that would trigger a big night migration, um, but we're a little bit confused about when it's actually going to happen because um, typically our big night migration shouldn't happen until April or even May. Um, down further south uh, in parts of New York State, like in the Hudson River Valley, the big night migration might typically happen in the middle or late March, early April. Uh, so climate change is causing really sporadic weather events and in, it's, essentially it's, it's causing some false starts. So instead of having some really, really big nights, now we're starting to see a few smaller nights spread out as different amphibians start to decide, okay, the time is right, here we go, we're gonna make this migration. Uh, so these are getting really a little bit harder to predict. They're happening earlier and earlier every year. Um, and that creates some challenges, uh, but uh, there's a lot of encouraging factors. Just like I showed in a, mo a moment earlier, 
uh, we're getting seasonal road closures for a salamander, which if you think about that, that's amazing. That's incredible support uh, for a species that doesn't get a lot of attention. One, because some people think they're not attractive, which if you see some of these pictures, I'm not sure how you can have that judgment. Uh, but the other one is that they're not a creature that you encounter very often unless you're looking for them. Uh, and a lot of times we don't uh, put money behind uh, creatures that are not part of our day-to-day -day or that aren't as charismatic as some of the other uh, creatures that we share the world with. Um, but we are seeing a lot of people starting to gather behind this big night migration. Uh, here's just a quick case study. There's a group called AM and RC in the Hudson River of New York State. Um, so amphibian migrations and road crossings. And this group is really a, a state funded uh, group that helps organize volunteers and train volunteers on how to assist with the big night migration. And just a few of their stats over the last 15 years, they've assisted 40,000 amphibians to cross the road. Uh, they've counted 19,000 amphibians killed by vehicles and observed 20 species. So part of this it, citizen science effort, because really that's what it is, is that it helps to identify road crossings that might be candidates for some of these underpasses. And then it also helps raise awareness of the fact that this is happening and maybe start to encourage people not to drive on evenings in the sp spring or to limit their driving during those two hours right um, at sunset. And it just heightens the importance of amphibians. Another reason why we should care about this beyond the fact uh, that they serve a, a strong ecological role. You know, these amphibians are helping to control pest species like uh, mosquitoes because they eat the larvae when they're young and some of the adult uh, amphibians also eat the adult uh, mosquitoes and other uh, pest insects and they help maintain keep those populations at a manageable level without our amphibians those uh, pest populations might be able to expand and spread additional diseases uh, in our areas so amphibians are really important from an ecological standpoint they also serve as a prey species for a lot of predators uh, from skunks to raccoons and other uh, birds that rely on amphibians for a primary food source uh, throughout the year. And uh, the other, let's see, I had another thought there. I'm sure it'll come to me, but we'll come back to it. Uh, but the big idea here is that they play a really important part in the uh, makeup of our ecosystems and they, without them, uh, our ecosystems will not function properly. Uh, and so it's really important to start to rally behind them. And there's a lot of encouraging efforts over especially the last 20 years in raising awareness of the big night migration and trying to ensure that there's proper habitat uh, for these animals and that they can get between the various different habitats that they occupy throughout the year. Uh, there has, have been some really amazing impacts of these conservation uh, citizen science efforts. Uh, and I'd encourage you to look at your uh, particular state environmental agencies. Often they either have a program dedicated to helping with the big night migration, or they will point you to the right conservation groups uh, who are working on something related to this. And then U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is also a great resource to be able to see uh, where these migrations are happening and how you might be able to get involved. And so this is just one part of the story of amphibians at large. And unfortunately, uh, more than half of our global amphibians could go extinct in our lifetime. And that's due to a confluence of a lot of factors uh, from habitat destruction, invasive species and often those invasive species are actually other amphibian species that don't belong in that particular ecosystem for example bullfrogs can be big predators of other amphibians in ecosystems where they're not native um, the other factor driving this is pollution as we talked about for an animal that can breathe through their skin uh, any kind of chemical pollutant in a system is just integrated into their bodies and they're just much more susceptible to that than other 
other creatures. Um, and then as we talked about, global warming is starting to upset uh, their life cycle. And, and those, you know, you can see based on needing to get to the vernal pool, mating in time for the young to be able to develop before that vernal pool dries out, all of those factors are, are heightened and amplified uh, when you factor in uh, climate change. Uh, the other huge, huge factor for amphibians that's stacked against them uh, is that diseases can really impact these creatures. And again, part of that is because of the permeability of their skin. The other part of that is that part of their biology is that they gather in these huge gatherings. So you can have hundreds of thousands of individuals in one small body of water all mating together. And so that's just a cesspool. It's just an opportunity for so many diseases to spread. Uh, so uh, one of the, the diseases that's particularly bad is the chytrid fungus. I'm sure you've heard um, at some point about this, maybe not by name, uh, but this is a fungus that's, that uh, travels among amphib amphibians and can be introduced really easily, uh, and it spreads like wild wildfire. Uh, so that one in particular has, has had a huge impact on amphibian populations. And then finally, road mortality. The encouraging thing here, I know I just listed a whole bunch of issues that are uh, facing these amphibians, but there are a lot of ways to help. And one of the biggest ways that you can think of in if you are in a region where these migrations are happening uh, for frogs and salamanders and newts, you can limit your driving when there are wet, warm spring nights. And in particular, you can limit your driving right at sunset for the next two hours. Again, this is a challenge. This might not be practical or possible in all scenarios, but this is something, a little insight into me, is that if I'm driving anytime, I'm always looking for critters and I will stop for them. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, in the springtime, if it is wet and rainy, uh, you can sit, find a safe place to pull over and help these critters cross the road. And sometimes that's just walking with them to allow them to hop or crawl to the other side. Sometimes that's picking them up, but again, we have to be really careful because if we haven't cleaned our hands properly and made sure that we don't have chemicals, that can also hurt uh, these individuals. But the big thing, if, if everyone's aware of it in the spring, uh, warm, warm, wet nights uh, to limit that driving, that's an excellent opportunity to help these guys out. Uh, the other one is to so, uh, show support for seasonal road closures. Uh, so these are efforts that are happening in various different communities, finding ways to shut down sections of road uh, that are have been identified as being right within this migration. Uh, and then the other thing you can do is to volunteer on these big night migrations. And the other important thing here is with training. So going back to those state agencies um, and conservation groups, a lot of them have online tools to get trained in on how to assist amphibians in crossing the road. And a lot of it is, is talking about ways to make sure that if you are handling them, that you're not transferring disease from one individual to another. Uh, so sanitizing in between and then the proper amount of water to make sure you don't have chemicals on your skin. Uh, but at the very least, uh, you can walk across the road and have some flashers and reflective gear uh, to be able to help raise awareness and slow folks down on, on these roads where uh, this is happening. There are particular places that I'll go to volunteer and help uh, amphibians cross the road on the big night. Um, and for me, it's just an incredible opportunity, especially on those really big nights. You look across the road, if you have a headlamp, you can see multiple salamanders crossing the road. I mean, there have been nights where I've seen, you know, 50 individuals from wood frogs to spotted salamanders to four-toed salamanders crossing the road. Uh, so volunteering on the big night can be a great way to meet other like-minded people. Um, and you can learn a lot about these species and it's just kind of a fun uh, event uh, to be able to help make an impact for uh, the amphibians that uh, share the same forest as us. Uh, the next uh, 
thing that you can think about is that you can look at your property. If you happen to own land, it's possible that you have a vernal pool on your property. You can meet with a forester. A lot of times foresters will actually evaluate your land for free, depending on the organization and the place. And you can actually go through a process to certify your vernal pool. And that helps uh, create a database and helps uh, raise awareness of, of this issue. Uh, and then looking for different conservation groups to donate uh, towards who are helping to work on this issue. So if this was an interesting chat for you, today was kind of the overview of what is big night migration and, and uh, how can we help. Next week, we're going to start to look at some specific species ID identification, as well as some photography tips uh, and get out in the field to do that. Uh, you know, I'm pretty amazed looking at the um, weather forecast that it's possible that tomorrow night would actually be a night in the Adirondacks where we're going to have some movement of amphibians. So I'll definitely head out and see if anything is happening and help some amphibians cross the road. So maybe I'll have some new updates there. Uh, I, I uh, you know, we're entering a time where it used to be a little bit predictable when the big night would happen. Even then we'd get it wrong. Uh, but now it's just uh, really hard to know when it's going to happen. Uh, if you're interested in this storytelling and learning more about this ecosystem, the Northern Forest, uh, you can follow my Northern Peatlands project. This is a project that I've been doing in after hours at Two Line Studio. Uh, if you scan this QR code or go to twoline.com slash tracks, you can sign up to get uh, news to your inbox every month and learn about peatlands and a lot of the creatures that call them home, including all these amphibians that we've been talking about today. So thank you so much for tuning in today, and I'll definitely open up for some questions, but uh, feel free to get in touch, uh, reach out, ask me questions, share some thoughts uh, from today's chat. But uh, thanks for being here, and we'll open it up and see if anyone has questions. Charlie, thank you so much. Um, before we start the Q&A, I want to remind everyone that they can submit their questions via the questions field in the control panel. And I see a lot of you have, have found that you can um, clap hands and send hearts and all those things and, and offer reactions without having to submit a question. So I'm glad you found that capability. It's nice to get some feedback. Um, we do have a bunch of great questions, though, so let's jump in. Um, do the salamanders head back to the woods after they mate, or do they hang around in the dry vernal pool all summer and migrate back in the fall? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, every species is a little bit different in how they approach this. For the most part, today we're kind of speaking in generalizations. Uh, most amphibians are going to mate and then make their way uh, back to the uplands, or they'll find another more permanent wetland uh, for the rest of the year or rest of the warm months. Uh, but the big thing there is that um, they're seeking out the best possible place to mate and to raise their young. Uh, and in some cases, you know, you might think that that term raising is the wrong application here, but there are instances of um, amphibians who are actually protecting their eggs and ensuring that their juveniles are making it to the next life stage. Um, so a lot of surprising research coming out there. But uh, these, these creatures will uh, go to the vernal pool, they'll mate, they'll spend some time there, uh, maybe a couple weeks, and then they'll move to another habitat, and then eventually they'll find the best habitat where they want to spend the winter. Uh, but after this initial big night migration and time at vernal pools, uh, maybe this, this kind of first month of time, you'll find them in wetlands, you'll find them hunting on the woodland floor looking for insects to eat and living under logs. Uh, so this is kind of the time of year where it's your best chance to go and find a salamander uh, if you go out and volunteer or, or spend some time looking for them on these big nights. Uh, they're the most visible now because after this, they kind of head into the woods and and uh, hide the rest of the year <laughs> from us anyway. <laughs> um, one of our viewers just moved from New England to the Pacific Northwest and a neighbor in the new area warned them to be a, 
on alert for black salamanders because they have poison in their skin. Are you aware <laughs> of this or do you know how poison poisonous they are? <laughs> I'd have to look that one up. I'm not familiar with uh, with that one. Uh, there are so so most amphibians have some level of toxin on their skin. Um, they have that to varying degrees. Uh, some of them, it is a toxin that if if it was were to get in a cut, it would sting. Uh, you'd be able to feel that. And then some amphibians actually have a parotid gland, and and there's a parotid gland, I guess. Um, and there's a lot of toxin and, and if you were to ingest that you could potentially die. So it's not out of the question, um, but I would definitely look that up and, and take a look to see what's going on there. Might be more of a consideration for kids putting it in their mouths. I'd, I'd be, I haven't heard of salamanders that you touch and then have an extreme reaction to, but I'll have to do a little digging to find out. <laughs> If if they can't avoid handling an amphibian, do garden gloves help? Would that be a good solution? Yeah, uh, you know, if you happen to find, uh, you know, a salamander, like say you've got a, a pile of uh, wood in the back and you're moving that wood inside and you happen to uncover a salamander, um, glo you know, garden gloves would be great. Again, the big thing here is that you don't want any chemicals uh, to touch the amphibian. So the, the best case scenario is just allowing that amphibian to move along. But if that's not uh, possible, you would just want to clean your hands with soap and water and then rinse with water uh, to make sure there's no residue left. And then you could carefully move the salamander uh, to a, a safer spot in the woods. Hmm. Is the big night for salamanders also a big night for predators of these species? Huh. You know, I haven't heard a lot about that, but I'd have to look into that. I would imagine that uh, there would be some opportunistic hunters. So some of the animals that will feed on amphibians include, you know, owls would, um, hawks. Uh, so some of the nocturnal animals, skunks um, and uh, coyotes and fox. Um, but again, there are some salamanders that are toxic enough that animals would avoid them. Um, so yeah, that's a great question. I haven't heard about whether uh, there's like a greater level of, of predator activity on those nights. Hmm. Do you know if our headlamps bother the amphibians? Yeah, you know, I've been in preparation for next week's uh, webinar. I've been looking into kind of some of the um, studies, I guess, or, or conversation around the ethics of, of photography of these species, because some people use flash or some people use headlamps as the lighting to be able to take pictures. Um, and there isn't anything very definitive that I've found yet, but you can tune in next week to find out a little bit more about that. And I'll, hopefully I'll have a little more information on that. Uh, but the general idea is that without a headlamp, you're really not going to be able to see them. And then you have a risk of stepping on them of any number of things. So if you're going to help them, you want to use the headlamp. There is a red setting on the headlamp. Um, if your eyes are good enough to be able to use that uh, to see uh, the salamanders, that doesn't uh, affect them as much. But from what I've read, if you're simply helping them move across the road very quickly and efficiently uh, using a headlamp is okay and they'll be on their merry way. Um, but I haven't come across any studies that necessarily look at that uh, impact. Hmm. How much notice do you get that there is a big night? Do you need to be on call? Yeah, so uh, you can sign up for email and text listservs. So depending on where you are, a lot of the folks call themselves like a salamander brigade. Uh, they have a special name for it in different regions. Uh, so you can get on a listserv and then uh, people like me who are going out all the time have a pretty good sense of it and they'll be able to say tonight looks like good conditions. Um, and you know a lot of this too is spending time getting it wrong <laughs> so you're you know you might get notice hey tonight's the night it looks good um, and then go out and you might not have any activity or very little activity 
Um, and as I mentioned, it's getting less and less predictable. Uh, so you're not uh, seeing this um, in the same regularity that you would before just because the amphibians are going at different times due to some of those climate uh, changes. So yeah, you can get on a listserv, you can look at the weather yourself. Again, if it's if it's the ground is thawed, um, the waterways are starting to open up and, and all, all these things have caveats though because some salamanders can walk across snow. Um, but ground is thawed, water is open, uh, it's a rainy night, especially at dusk and the next two hours. Um, and then knowing where to go because the salamanders aren't crossing roads everywhere. Uh, they're crossing roads at particular places where that road happens to cross their migration from the upland areas to their critical uh, vernal pool or wetland habitats where they're going to mate. Hmm. Do you know if anyone has considered using pheromones to guide amphibians to and through the underground tunnels? <laughs> I haven't heard about that or read anything about that. Um, the, the short um, fencing is very effective um, and often it's a pretty limited area, you know, maybe a two mile stretch of road, maybe even smaller than that. Uh, where they're crossing. So those underpasses and overpasses are pretty effective as long as a, a good amount of research has gone into figuring out exactly where they should go. Uh, but of course, amphibians can cross the road anywhere. So uh, it's just these events where it's really concentrated in one place where we're trying to make sure that more salamanders are crossing the road. Hmm. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how climate change is affecting um, the mid-Atlantic states? Um, if the ground froze at all this winter, it was minimal and of short duration. How does this impact the cycles of these creatures? That's a really great question. So uh, one of the things that we're seeing um, are these freeze-thaw cycles uh, and Typically, there'd be a winter warm-up. We call it the January thaw, the February thaw. Uh, but right now, we're seeing long stretches of time that are hovering around the freezing point or even above the freezing point, where in these regions, it used to just be the dead of winter below freezing for extended periods of time. And these creatures, as we talked about, they are able to freeze. So they actually move sugar and water around to protect vital organs, and they freeze in the winter. They shut down all activity, essentially. Um, and so when we have these times that if we have winters that don't stay cold and they're bouncing up above freezing and we don't have a snowpack, that's actually putting a lot of stress on plants and animals, including amphibians. Um, and uh, in particular, thinking about amphibian habitat, one of the key things that they rely on is, is moss and sphagnum moss. I'm trying to see if I have a slide here uh, that would be helpful for that. Let's go up to, there it is. On the left-hand side, we're seeing some moss, not huge sphagnum moss, but um, sphagnum moss, in a, similar to amphibians, goes through what we call a hardening process where uh, it actually shunts water into the exterior of the sphagnum where ice forms and it creates that initial layer and then snow falls and snow is a great insulator. So if you've got a good um, snowpack, everything underneath stays at about the freezing point at about 32 degrees. Now, when we were talking about these organisms, plants and animals who are shunting sugars around to protect their vital organs, that's helping to depress the freezing point of those organs so that they don't form ice at low temperatures. But at a certain point, ice will form if it gets cold enough. So the big impact that we're seeing is that there's much less of a snowpack throughout the winter, which is removing that layer of insulation from a lot of the critters who are either freezing or trying to uh, get to a more normal climate. And those critters, um, they, they could have uh, ice forming in their vital organs and then they could, they could die from that. Um, and in addition, sphagnum moss 
if it doesn't have the snow cover that it depends on uh, for the most of the winter, um, it can also die off because it's getting too cold exposed to the air. So all these organisms have evolved to be in a very particular microclimate um, in their area. Um, and we're starting to see big uh, changes to those ecosystems. I, I think that organisms are pretty resilient. I don't think that this is right now, we're not in a place where it's gonna cause a huge problem, but if the trends continue, um, this would be a big issue. And then it's compounded for amphibians because we're having drier summers, which those vernal pools are drying up. And if the frogs haven't gotten to the point or you know, tadpoles haven't um, gone into the adult phase, uh, they'll not be able to survive uh, drying out. Um, so those are the big concerns. So it's, it's affecting a lot of different things. The plants are stressed out, the animals are stressed out, and a big part of it kind of comes down to that snowpack and the insulation that it provides. So that's a great question. Well, this is fascinating. And we are already looking forward to part two. Did you already tell us when that's going to be or how people can yeah, sign so, up? Uh, next week, uh, it's on March 14th. Uh, you can join again at, uh, for the Daily Dose of Nature with Natural Habitat Adventures. And we'll dive into some of the specific stories behind uh, some of the creatures that you'll find up in my neck of the woods in the Adirondacks from wood frogs to spotted salamanders to four-toed salamanders. And we'll also talk about photography tips and some of those ethics around uh, what does it mean to use light with wildlife, uh, and especially for a species that's moving in the dark. You know, what's the benefit that you can get from having an image that can inspire conservation and what's the detriment to that individual, if there is one, uh, with using those, those uh, pieces of equipment. So we'll chat about that and uh, continue the conversation and raise awareness of uh, these incredible migrations that are happening uh, all over North America in different parts of the country. So thanks for tuning in. Well, thank you. I, I'll turn it back to you for any closing comments you might have, or may, that might have been your closing comments, but <laughs> glad that everybody knows when to tune in again. Do you have anything to Absolutely. add? Or? Yeah, uh, you know, I'll be talking about this topic again next week. So if you have particular questions, uh, feel free to reach out and I'll see if I can cover them uh, at the chat next week. So thanks for tuning in. Excellent. I also want to thank everybody for tuning in and for submitting such great questions. Please join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.